congratulations on your essay. And I want to talk about your belief that we should have compulsory national service. It is a bold idea, and I love that. And start off by introducing yourself and telling the story of the bar in Pamplona. Sure. Thanks, David. Um, this fellowship has been a great experience. And, um, you know, compulsory national service, kind of a hot button topic, but I like a challenge. So I wanted to jump right in and uh, see what it was all about. So yeah, I'll start with this story here. And, and this is a story that Sebastian Younger relates in his book, Tribe. And I thought it was really you know, fitting to set the scene for this. So basically, he's in Pamplona, Spain, and it's the night before the running of the bulls. And this is during the festival of San Fermin. It's like a seven day festival or a nine day festival or something in Spain. And the night before the running of the bulls, the tradition is that everybody goes out to the bar and basically just gets hammered, right? And it's an all night party and they drink wine and, and sangria and party all night and show up the next morning at the running of the bulls without having slept, still wearing the same clothes, sh soaked in sangria and everything. And it's, you know, it's, it's a blast according to him. I haven't been there, but um, when he was there, he made friends with some Spaniards in the bar. So there are these two Spaniards and he was drinking and carrying on with them. And through the door walked these three Moroccan men. And the biggest of the Moroccan men walks over to the Spaniards and, and Sebastian Younger. And the, one of the Spaniards is wearing a Viking helmet on his head. And the Moroccan looks at him and, and takes the helmet off his head. And he says, this is mine now. And immediately this, the other Spaniard kind of snatches it back from the Moroccans. And then you have these five guys all with their hands on this Viking helmet and they're pulling it back and forth. And, and the, the Spaniard says, well, wait, 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 it's going to rip. It's going to rip. So then he looks at Sebastian Younger and says, can you take my place at the helmet and, and defend it with, with your honor of, of your family? Right. And Sebastian Younger's like, what the hell's going on here? How long do you have to know somebody before you get in a bar fight for him? Right. <laughs> <laughs> so he takes this place at the helmet and the Spaniard takes off to the bar and he comes back with this jug of wine and he begins to pour it into the the uh, Viking helmet that's upside down right and then he he empties the jug into the helmet and he puts his hand under the helmet and he looks at everybody and says now let go and surprisingly all the guys let go and then he holds the the helmet up to the biggest Moroccan guy and he says you're a guest in my country so you drink first and the Moroccan guy takes the helmet and, you know, tips it up to his face and drinks the wine and spills it down his cheeks and sloshes it down his shirt. And then he passes it to the, the guy to his left and the next guy drinks and they, they pass it around the circle like this until the helmet's empty. And then they go get another jug and they, they refill it again. And, you know, before you know it, the helmet is lost under a table and all these drunk guys have their arms around each other singing and dancing and, and carrying on. And uh, what Younger says he learned from this is how close the energy of conflict and closeness can be. Hmm. And there, there's really this kind of tipping point where it can go one way or, or the other. And he says that human potential is really organized around um, this tipping point. And, and the key is to convince people that they have more in common than they have in conflict. So... I started the essay using that story as kind of a metaphor of where the United States is right now. We're kind of in 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 a conflict in a in a polarizing state and we need somebody to fill our helmet with the wine, right? Like we need this this lubricating effect to bring us all back together. Um, and I think compulsory national service can do that. Yeah, I want to start off by sort of setting the background, and then we'll dive into the very specific policy prescriptions that you provide. I love this sentence. Compulsory national service can be the wine that nourishes our soul. It can drown out the differences, bring us together, and turn adversaries into allies. It's spot on. And what you begin to do is you begin to talk about just the dramatic decline in the share of Americans who have military service. And so later on, when you begin to critique the critiques of your idea you're not saying here everyone's got to go join the army this isn't some new draft this is something else entirely but talk about the background cultural scenario of what's happening here you talk a little bit about teachable teach for america you talk a little bit about the declining numbers of veterans in our country talk about that 
Yeah, sure. So humans have evolved to live in in tribes, right? Like the first humans were hunter gatherers and they lived in these small roving bands where everybody had a job and that job was vital for the success of of the tribe, right? And, and some of the people were warriors and when they would fight with another tribe, um, that conflict was very close and very real. In America today, as I, as I talk about in the essay, very, very few people have served in the military. It's like less than 8% of the total right. population and less than 1% of the population is active in the military right now. So we, we're very far removed from conflict, whereas we weren't um, in, in tribal history, right? Um, so we're designed to want to work together closely with people and we're designed to really favor the in-group because it was crucial for our survival and not favor the out group. So, you know, you fast forward thousands of years to today where you can graduate from college and move to a city and get an apartment by yourself and go work in a job where you don't really connect with anybody. And then you come home and you cook your own dinner and you eat by yourself and nobody's relying on you and you're not relying on anybody and you just have this emptiness inside. So you, you, you want to belong to a tribe. So what we do is we create these kind of pseudo tribes that we put ourselves into. And, and the most prominent of those are political parties, right? So you've got this increasing polarity between Republicans and, and Democrats. So let me back up a little bit. There are in, in tribes, uh, you know, thousands of years ago, there was a common enemy, right? And it was the other tribe. In modern times, occasionally we have a common enemy and, and, during World War II, that was something like the Axis powers. During the Cold War, that was something like communism, right? right. But after the Cold War, we kind of lack this common enemy. So we've, we've created these groups where we can have a common enemy. And the, the common enemy for the Republicans are Democrats, and the common enemy for Democrats are Republicans. So we kind of go through these periods where polarization increases until we have a common enemy somewhere else. And what Pew Research found, uh, I think four or five years ago, was that um, the number of, of, of extremes for conservatives and for liberals had, had doubled. And what also had increased were the number of people, the number of conservatives who thought liberals were an actual threat to the nation and, and vice versa. It was the same on either side. So that's kind of where we're heading with polarization and, and tribalization. Yeah, I was just talking to a friend and she was telling me about her relationship with her boyfriend and her boyfriend's roommate overtly told them that the relationship wasn't going to last because their politics were too different and we were just talking about this about how now they've made it a year and a half and things are going really well but i think the fact that that is so sprinkled into society now and it's a big it's a big theme and i think that in this essay you have some really good data on something that is part of the cultural milieu but you actually show how Basically, since 1990, we have become more and more polarized. But I want to sort of transition here into adversity. You know, Sebastian Younger is this great quote, this great quote on Joe Rogan's podcast where he says, adversity produces pro-social behaviors and the lack of adversity, safety and comfort allows people to act selfishly. And it reminds me of a quote that I heard from a friend who he's lived in Brazil, he's lived in Ukraine. He's lived in Mexico. He's lived in America. And I said, hey, what are some of the observations that you've had from living in all these places? And he said, when I lived in Brazil, when I lived in parts of the world that weren't as safe, the communities came together. And that's when life felt the most rich, felt the most full. People come together to help each other, to take care of each other. And what you see is David Brooks has a great quote in his podcast with Tyler Cowen where he says that in America, what we do is we get wealthy and we buy loneliness. We move to a house away from other people. We move and you're seeing now that houses, the average square footage is getting bigger and bigger. Robert Putnam, bowling alone, people are spending less time in churches, communities, and there's this weird correlation between wealth and 
antisocial behavior. And mm. I think that you're hitting on a lot of this, which might then lead to some of the polarization that we see in America. Yeah, I think that's totally true. And, you know, Sebastian Younger says something very similar. We, we have people who have been successful, you know, they've made it financially and they drive into their gated communities and into the cul-de-sac and up their long driveway and into the garage and the garage door goes down behind them and they walk into their house and they never have to talk to their neighbors. Yeah. You know, you contrast that with somebody who lives in a walk up in New York City. Even if you don't have any friends in the building, you're going to see some people, right? And and we were made to see other people and interact with other people on a daily basis. So when we're not doing that, it's you know, it's bad for our health and it's bad for our our communities. And so something that I found really interesting was I recently interviewed a guy named Brendan O'Byrne, and he was in Sebastian Younger's documentary, Restrepo. So he was he was deployed to Afghanistan, the, the Korangal Valley in 2007. And this was like the deadliest place on earth at the time. And what's so counterintuitive is that he said he felt more human when he was there than when he came home. You know, he said, I felt more like a human on top of a hill shooting at people with people shooting at me than I do in America. And he said, it feels so fucking good, <laughs> you know, and we just we just don't have that shared struggle anymore because we have so much comfort. And that's not to say that, you know, war is a good thing. That's don't confuse my words there. That's not what I'm saying. But a shared struggle is certainly a good thing and a little bit of adversity. Um like you said, produces pro-social behaviors. Yeah, absolutely. Can you talk a little bit about William James? I thought that the William James parts of this essay were 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 so strong, and we could get into some of the quotes, but talk about the, the, the central idea of William James writing more than 100 years ago and how that begins to frame your argument. Yeah, that's what I found so crazy is – he wrote this essay called The Moral Equivalent of War, and he wrote it in the early 1900s, I believe. I think it was before World War I. And the argument he makes here is that war hardens a country, and not only a country, it hardens the citizens. And it, he means harden in a good way. You know, it creates these um, character traits that are only created under pressure, right? So when we're at war, um, we work together, we just generally have stronger character. And when we're not at war, we transition to what he calls a pleasure economy. And so he, what he wants to create is this, this uh, moral equivalent of war, where it's not us sending our, our youth off to fight battles in faraway places, but it's sending them off, like he says, to coal mines and, and freight trains, to fishing fleets, to... Um, clothes and window washing to all these jobs that like really suck and nobody wants to do them but it, it teaches you discipline it teaches you the value of hard work and it, it teaches you um, unity because you're working side by side with, with other people and what's really interesting about this is somebody might say okay, okay he wrote this 115 years ago or whatever how is this relevant now but Peter Thiel actually published an essay just a few months ago where he talks about how our society is, is laden with decadence. And he says – so he defines that as stagnation and complacency. And that's that's William James's pleasure economy, right? This, this is 100 years apart, and you have two intelligent people saying essentially the same thing. So I, I think there's something there. Absolutely. I mean, I think that this is a big part of what's happening in modern culture right now. I mean, I think in that essay, Peter Thiel was responding to Ross Duthit's new book on decadence. And this is exactly what Duthit is saying, that we have become complacent and we have become decadent precisely because things are so good right now. And you see this in sort of the lack of just boldness and originality and the fight and the fire that comes in that society that would have, to use the words of William James, a moral equivalent of war. And for the first time in years, I've seen that fire come out in with even coronavirus, like mm. this, this, 
this horrible, confusing moment has been illuminating to see how people rise up. I had a friend in New York leave his company, start a new business, and do that whole process in two weeks. You have people like wow. Patrick Collison and Paul Graham and and the founder of Spotify or Shopify who teamed up and started Fast Grants and they're trying to give out grants in 48 hours or less. And you have Bill Gates building seven new plants for vaccines and saying yes. at best two of them are going to work. You have Jack Dorsey giving away 28% of his net worth. And so you have all of these movements to fight the virus and you have this fire and a courage and honestly just like a, i don't care get out of my way we have a mission to do that i haven't seen before and you know it reminds me of there was a screenshot to that tim urban at wait but why shared and it was a series of text messages from a doctor living in new york city and of course, what was happening in the hospitals was terrible. I mean, just terrible, right? You have all these people dying. There's not enough ventilators and all these sorts of things. But at the same time, what the doctor had said to Tim and what Tim had shared, keeping the doctor's identi identity anonymous, was this is also the best time to be a doctor. People are rising up from lower ranks and they're adopting leadership position and the hierarchy doesn't matter again. People in the hospital feel like they have purpose, feel like, all the hours and hours and hours that they've spent trying to train this is their moment this is their chance to save lives and this is a time when we can unite against a shared enemy against a shared problem and come together to do the vocational work that we were put on this planet to do that's that's exactly it and it's you know it's reminiscent of world war ii you know uh, bill gates creating these factories it's that's like private companies turning their factories to to build munitions or, or whatever was necessary at the time and you know like you talk about th these doctors were kind of rising to the occasion people are feeling meaning and belonging and and uh, another example from sebastian younger he says during the the blitz in london the, the firebombing you had people with psychiatric conditions who would have been hospitalized before driving ambulances because they can function now because they feel like they have meaning in society. Now, obviously that's, that's probably an exaggeration, but um, that's, that's, that's a general idea. What is both good and bad about the situation we're in now with COVID is that sure it's, it's going to unite us, but with any luck, we're going to be out of the woods here within hopefully two, three, four months, right? So it's it doesn't have the duration of something like World War II or the Cold War. So my 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 thoughts on this is that we're gonna experience this this really great unity and, and coming together to fight this this thing right now, but by the end of the year that's that's gonna disappear. Right. So a program like Compulsory National Service, it's it's a, a systemic solution to not just the the problem of disunity, but to to a lot of things, and it it, it transcends current events. I think. Yeah, talk about it. So talk about Marcus and go through the lens of one person and what it would look like to do compulsory national service. And I want to sort of deflect the counter arguments at the beginning. So this isn't you're going to war. And what are some of the other counter arguments that you can address after you talk about Marcus? Sure. Yeah. So some of the other counter arguments are are that this would be too big to implement, and you know that that's a fair criticism. This is not a small thing to do, but the way to approach it is it's a scaled implementation over say ten years, right? And we do it in steps. Um, first of all, making it increasingly easier to serve for those who want to serve because there is a demand for this that's not able to be met right now, um, and then as it becomes more normal. It, it won't be hard to make it mandatory because so many people will already be doing it, right? And and we'll we'll use a decentralized approach. And there there are a lot of things that I've thought through to kind of uh, handle the bureaucracy of this. So that's that's also one of the um, one of the big arguments against it. And then, like you said, I'm not talking about the draft, right? Like I'm not trying to make you join the army. That's not what I'm saying here. So that that's that's a moot point. 
Um, the other thing that, that opponents typically raise is that this is unconstitutional. It violates the, the 13th mm -hmm. Amendment, right? Now, on its face, you'd say, oh, yeah, this is, uh, this is kind of like slavery, right? Well, it, it's really not. Um, and a couple of examples here are, are draft law cases, right? They, they have all been upheld as being constitutional. So if you're going to look at it from that perspective, if the, if the draft is constitutional, this is really not too much different from that. Um, and then another case, there was a high school student whose high school required him to complete like 40 hours of community service to graduate, right? And he said, well, this, this infringes upon my 13th Amendment right. Um, that, that case was also not decided in his favor. So for any people who say this violates the 13th Amendment, I can't really find um, any case law that would support that, that opinion. But we can jump back and kind of talk through yeah, what I it might. Yeah, I want to know what are the specifics of the proposals? Sure, yeah. So when, when you're in high school, you know, your senior year, you're going to apply to whatever program you want to apply to. And that could be a National Park Service program. It could be a teacher's aid program. It could be working with elderly people. It could be any number of things. You know, there are going to be hundreds of programs for this. But the example that I use in the essay and go into detail on is the National Parks example, because I think that's the easiest to understand. Mm -hmm. So uh, I talk about this kid named Marcus who's from New York City, and he wants to be in the National Parks uh, maintenance program. So he applies. He's from New York City. He has to apply outside of his, his geographic location. So the country will be broken up into like eight different locations. And so he applies for Zion National Park, right? And he gets accepted there. So he graduates high school in May or June. The beginning of July, he goes out to Zion National Park, moves into the bunkhouse there with 60 or 70 or 80 other uh, people who just graduated from high school. And then for an entire year, he works 40 hours a week side by side with all the other students doing things like trail maintenance or digging ditches or cutting grass or hiking the trails to make sure people visiting the park um, are okay or don't need assistance or, or guidance or anything like that. Basically, anything that needs to be done in the park, upkeep, anything, will be done by these students. Mm -hmm. right? And they'll work 40 hours a week and then they'll come back and they'll eat their meals in, in a cafeteria together. And then... They'll go to sleep in a bunkhouse together and, you know, it's, it's going to be a bunkhouse. It's going to be heated and have all the, all the amenities that you need, but it's not going to have TV. You know, it's not going to have um, computer games and arcades and that kind of stuff. Like it's going to be kind of Spartan because we want this to be kind of like adversity, right? And over the course of the year, what I, what I think will happen is that, you know, you're forced to work side by side with these people on a common goal. You're all working towards the same thing. So somebody might say, well, well, yeah, that's college, right? Like everybody's coming from different places and, and, and meeting in the same place and spending years together. Well, that's true to an extent, but in college, you're not necessarily working towards the same goal with the same people, right? Like if you're somebody from New York who is, uh, you know, white male from New York, you can go to college anywhere and find other white males that you want to hang out with and really not have to hang out with anybody else if you don't want to because you're not working on this same thing side by side together every day. Uh, a compulsory service program forces you to really uh, get tight with these other people and spend a lot of time with them. And when you're working on a common goal and you're spending day after day together and you have conversations and you learn about where people are from and what their experiences were like, it's pretty hard to dislike them when you spend that much time with somebody. As one of my podcast guests said, it's hard to hate up close. Hmm, that's a great line. So basically what you're proposing is I graduate from high school and I have to go do some compulsory national service. And this isn't enlisting in the military. It is a series of ways that I can serve this country Th from infrastructure, one of the great lines that you have in this is that the average age of American infrastructure has been rising since the mid 1960s. And in just as of 2016, infrastructure was on average 24 years old. And then the American Society of Civil Engineers graded America's infrastructure at a D plus. 
a D plus. It's bad. And yeah. <laughs> this is in a country that calls itself the greatest country in the world, a country that believes in its own exceptionalism. And so what you're saying is that compulsory national service, if I wanted to participate to make the infrastructure better, I could do that. And it would reduce the price tag of America's infrastructure because we would have way more supply of people to help. Then I could then that would then have downstream effects for construction later on. Uh, so that's just another example. So what I could do is I could choose all of these different avenues. And what you're saying is you had a great line that the number of people moving across state lines is the lowest that it's been, I think, since 1947. And mm, so the yep. reason why you want to bracket up the 50 states into eight different sections is so that people are moving to different parts of the country, seeing what's happening in all those different places, having a cross pollination of America, having people then serve their country, and then everybody needs to do that. So what would, okay, so we have this culture of freedom in America, but you need to have some kind of punishment if somebody doesn't participate. So say I am above this all, you know, mm. I, Joe, I just don't feel like doing this. What are some of the consequences? Yeah. So there, there are a number of things that we could do to, pre to prevent people from kind of shirking their duty here. Right. And it, it ranges from everything from, okay, you can choose not to do this. We're not going to make you do this, but if you, if you opt out, you're never going to be eligible for any government benefits, right? Because as a citizen, we're asking you to give one year of your life in service to your country and you're going to be paid for it and it's not going to be dangerous and it's really not even going to be that hard or unpleasant, right? Like, so one year of your life in exchange for any benefit you might need in the future, whether that's federal student loans or debt forgiveness or unemployment insurance, any of that stuff, you're going to forego that, um, by saying no, I, I don't want to. I don't want to serve. So, what somebody might say to that is, "Well, what if you come from a wealthy family and you don't ever need those things?" So, the other thing that I would encourage here is that professional associations, um, the bar association, CPAs, all that stuff, they should require that you cannot become licensed unless you've served one year of service. Right. So anybody who wants to go into any career that would require a license, you know, a plumber, a lawyer, a doctor, any of those things that require a license, those governing bodies should do the right thing and say, uh, we're not going to license you unless you've given a year of service to your country. Um, additionally, colleges and universities should be required to only admit students who have done a year of service. Right. And we could tie federal funding to that because. Uh, universities receive like $40 billion a year. So they're not going to jeopardize that huge amount of funding by saying, oh, well, we're going to accept whoever we want. Right. So there, there are a number of levers we can pull here without actually uh, creating any, I don't want to say without creating legislation, but without specifically saying you have to do this. So to, as we begin to sort of put a ribbon over all this, what is, it for you your lived experiences how you view the world that made this something that you wanted to write an essay about you know i consider myself to be a problem solver and i'm fascinated with societal issues and trends so those two things kind of converged and then at the same time, I am a huge fan of Sebastian Younger, and I've followed his work for a long time. And he kind of tossed this idea out there, and I was like, you know what? That sounds like it makes a lot of sense. I want, I want to explore this. Um, so I, I dove in and then just found, especially the tribalism pieces, to be very interesting. And what I find so troubling is that, especially on social media, social media really amplifies this. If If I think one thing, and, and David, you think something else like, I don't know, we could talk abortion, we could talk gun laws, anything, anything that's like kind of polarizing. If I have one opinion and you have a different opinion, you might think that I'm bad or that I'm evil or that I'm just outright wrong and you don't want to be my friend, right? Like you don't want to marry into my family. You don't want to live in the same neighborhood as I do. You know, where did we change as a country where a, a difference in opinion 
makes you a bad person. That's really scary to me and that's troubling and that's not what this country was founded upon and I think we need to get away from that. We need to be able to have civil conversations where we can say, okay, I don't necessarily agree with your opinion, but there's some common ground we can come to here and you're not a bad person for holding that opinion, right? Um, if we don't right the ship on that, uh, we're, we're headed in a, in a bad direction. So that that's really what got me interested in this. Beautifully said. Joe Wells, congratulations on your essay. Thanks, David. A lot of fun.